Hi guys, and welcome back to my channel. Today I am here with Pim Jansen. She is a nutritionist, a biomedical scientist, a personal trainer, a life coach, and a sugar addict in recovery. <laughs> she specializes in helping people overcome sugar addiction. And I wanted to bring her on today because I feel like we're on the same page on a lot of topics, um, especially regarding things like how natural sweeteners and artificial sweeteners can still trigger um, your sugar addiction without actually being sugar. Um, so yeah, we're just going to talk about what sugar addiction is, why it happens, and how to get over it. So welcome, Pim. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about, I guess, your sugar journey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate that. So yeah, you gave me a, a quite a good introduction to me. So my sugar addiction probably started when I was very young. I remember when I was maybe five, six years old already uh, climbing. <laughs> my mom liked to sleep in in the mornings and I used to climb up into the cupboards and look for the cookies that I knew exactly where she was hiding them early in the morning before she went up. So that's actually how far back I can remember this. And being, you know, a health professional, I've been working as a personal trainer for 10, 15 years, um, diet advisor for at least 10 years before or at the same time as I was studying nutrition as well. And all this probably comes from me wanting to optimize my diet and be in control of it and totally failing. <laughs> I was telling people to not eat sugar and here I was, just couldn't stop eating sugar myself. So I always made up some excuses for myself, I guess, because I was eating healthy in general and uh, everything was very nutritious, very good food if you exercise a lot. Well, at least I thought so at the time. But at the same time, I just couldn't skip that sugar on top of it. Always after a meal, I had to have something sweet. It was like, it, it felt like I was possessed and I just kept doing it and I didn't have any control over it until the first time I actually went keto. Yeah. Then I felt like, wow, it went away. But I got like some sort of hybrids and thought, yeah, now I can handle it. And you start and you have one bite and it's fine. And then you have two bites, you have three bites and then you're stuck again. And my world just unraveled and I hadn't found the solution. And I don't know how many times I did this. That's been going on for years and I've kept looking. And eventually I found the answer through life coaching actually and I didn't hire my coach or well, it, it was a group coaching program it wasn't I didn't join for my sugar addiction I joined for other reasons but she actually specialized in overeating of foods in general and I never thought of myself as an emotional eater because those kind of people they are people that are very stressed or they because I'm very laid back. I'm cool with pretty much everything. And yeah. I'm not like that. I'm not getting upset about things. I don't eat when I'm sad. I don't do these things. But what I found out is that I'm eating when I'm bored or when I need to procrastinate or when I'm feeling restless. And that is a lot of the time because I'm one of these people that like doing things. So I think that was the missing piece for me because I've had the nutrition piece for 20 years. <laughs> I got yeah. that down. But it is not always a deficiency of something. It's actually an emotion and it's a lot harder to deal with than I ever thought. So now I'm at the place where I'm in control of my sugar. I haven't actually quit sugar entirely yet because okay. my brain is just like, no, that is scary. We don't want to go there. I'm going to miss out on something. But next year I'm going to... And I'm at the place where I want to not want it anymore. Yeah, I, My brain still wants it. But I, I'm now prepared to go into the next phase, I guess, of saying, yeah, I actually want to not want it. So this is going to be my goal over the next year to, to work towards the not wanting it anymore. Mm -hmm. Because so far, I have been working towards getting control of my eating habits. And I've been mainly successful everyone has their own drawbacks and we're falling back into it and so on but yeah so that's where I am I hope that was 
wasn't too long. <laughs> no, no, that was perfect. Um, I can totally relate. I am a bored eater. I do it to procrastinate as well. And I have to catch myself like, ah, oh, it's, it's really hard working from home too, because I'll kind of justify. I'm like, oh, it's like time for lunch, but I'm not actually hungry. I'm just kind of doing it to avoid something else. And yeah, that's a big realization. Um, <laughs> all right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like the science of why yeah. we get addic addicted to sugar, why we have sugar cravings. So do you know exactly like what goes on in our bodies? What go what happens in the brain? Um, like why these things are triggered? Yeah. Okay. So we are actually perfectly designed to survive and seek out foods that's what we do otherwise we would have died out so our bodies and our brains are adjusted to this and we will seek nutrient dense and also calorie dense foods mainly calorie dense and anything that is sweet is obviously very calorie dense and it will give you the energy very quickly so we are naturally adapted to seek out fat and sugar preferably in that combination because that tastes very nice to us <laughs> yeah so what actually happens is that to to teach us that it's a good thing our brains will then we have something in the brain that is called the reward center and you will have a dopamine release so that is a neurotransmitter you will have a dopamine release every time you eat something but whether you have a huge dopamine release or not depends on what food you're eating. So dopamine it will stimulate several different areas in the brain, but that will pretty much stimulate what we call the pleasure center or the reward center. So it will make you feel good and happy and all those things. And that will obviously make you want to seek out that food again. So that's how we learn that that is a very good thing to do. And sugar is really, really good at doing this. And so uh, all, all processed foods are really good at doing this, actually, unfortunately, because they have the right combination of fat and sugar and salt and all the yummy things. And the food scientists that create them, they know exactly how this works and they will design them to work that way. So if you have a steak, for example, let's say on a scale from one to 10, you have a dopamine release of three when you eat the steak. But when you eat something like a chocolate cake, you might have a dopamine release of an eight. So you will have a lot more dopamine released when you're eating a cake, which means that you will feel your brain will think that this food is the shit that will keep you alive. That will yeah. really make you happy and it will help you produce offspring and everyone will be fat, happy and merry and we will live on forever. So that's that's great. The problem is that in our brains, the, the um, we have receptors, dopamine receptors that will actually transform this signal into the pleasure that you feel. So we have, everyone has a set amount, which is different for different people. But when you have something like sugar that is just producing so much dopamine, you will have an overstimulation of these receptors and your brain is not designed to handle this much dopamine at once. So it will start to downregulate those receptors. It will break them down. So the next time you have the chocolate cake, you won't get the same response. You will get a little bit less pleasure. So you will want to eat more of that chocolate cake to get to the same level as yeah. you got before because your brain is now, hang on, Last time we were this happy, why are we just 80% happy this time? We need, we clearly need more chocolate cake. And that's how that goes on. So eventually you can break down those dopamine receptors, you know, quite a lot. So you will need more and more and more to just feel normal. Eventually yeah. you don't even feel happy from eating that chocolate cake. And I, I definitely know this. <laughs> <laughs> I could just sit and eat and I think it doesn't even taste nice anymore. And still I want I to do it. It's crazy. But that's what's happening. So how tempting is it then to eat a steak, which is a three on the dopamine release scale? It doesn't even create the response that a three used to do anymore. It might be one and a half now. So I don't feel freaking steak anymore. I just want cake. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we build up to that. Yeah. Can we um, do our receptors repair and rebuild or they do? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You can totally restore your brain. It's not permanent damage in terms of the receptors whatsoever. 
Yeah. So that that's the good news. <laughs> the the bad news is that even though the receptors seem to come back very quickly, um, the the production of dopamine from these responses can also go down. So there always seems to be an overlap. If you quit sugar completely, there always seems, at least in my opinion, from myself and my clients, seems to be four to six weeks where everything feels pretty shit, if okay. I may use that word. <laughs> yeah. Life is just grey, boring, nothing's fun anymore. But when you pass those four to six weeks, you will notice and things that you actually enjoyed in the past are actually quite enjoyable now. But yeah. you might be really, really grumpy during that time. And think life is not fun. And you have to be prepared to go through that. And it's not an easy thing to do. You need to be prepared to do that in order to quit permanently. And I think many people don't really anticipate how dreadful that can feel. Yeah. Um, do you think some people are more susceptible to becoming addicted to sugar than others? Or do you think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, I think some people are more susceptible to be addicted nonstop. Okay. And that is, has a lot to do with your genes. So some people are actually born with so if you have addiction in your family, you will be more likely to be addicted to something yourself. And that is because a lot of it has to do with how much ser- sorry, not serotonin, dopamine you're producing as a response to anything. And that is often low in those type of people. I'm not sure I actually fit in there because I have never been addicted to anything but sugar. And okay. I don't have any any problem with anything else. So I'm probably not one of these people that have those genes but I don't know I haven't tested I don't even know if you can test it yeah but when that's low you're going to go through life and feel unsatisfied with pretty much everything because you don't ever get that response that you kind of crave and when you find something that will produce it which could be anything whether that is you know alcohol tobacco uh, heroin sugar porn you name it anything that people can be addicted to you will want to keep doing it because it finally makes you feel whole or, Mm -hmm. you know, you get that response that you don't get from normal things in life. So, yeah, I think those people are more likely to be, um, become addicted to something. But then you have other factors as well, like environment. Um, it's, It's very common that children who have been abused are becoming addicted to things so that I think that's more emotional that is hiding b- behind food whether that is you know uh, rape victims often gain weight because they don't want to be seen and they think if I'm fat and ugly and no one will want me anymore really you know all the deep stuff I don't really deal with that I'm not, not psychologist and then you have other people that just want to pretty much drown their sorrows in sugar rather than alcohol but it could be both. Yeah. Well, many more things. Um, is food addiction the same as sugar addiction? Or do you think they're two separate things? Or they kind of go together? Um, I think they go together. I'm not a, I'm not a food addict myself. I'm, I'm pretty mm-hmm. much sugar. <laughs> the, the response in the brain, everything is the same. There's no difference whether you're addicted to pizza or chocolate. It doesn't okay. really matter. But it's also a learned behavior that we're doing. So you're teaching yourself that this food it tastes good and it will help me with whatever prob- my problem is, whether that's low dopamine or I feel depressed or um, I have I have some procrastination I need to get done <laughs> by eating. Yeah. You know, whatever your problem is, that food is probably your go-to food. But like with ev- everything in life, I'm... I have I'm not a person that even likes alcohol. I don't think I could become addicted to it even if it stimulates my dopamine because that's not my preference. So I think it has a lot to do with your preference and obviously what you think tastes nice, etc. Okay. Um so for someone who is currently struggling with sugar, what do you recommend? Like do you recommend they cut it out 100% right off the bat or kind of wean off it? What is your take on that? Okay, I think for most people, it's actually easy to cut it out straight away. 
mm-hmm. at least for a period of time, let's say three weeks, because then you get rid of the physiological cravings that you usually have, which is with the, the insulin going up and down and all those kind of things. Then you have the emotional part left to deal with, which I think pretty much everyone has. Um, for some people, it works to kind of slowly go down. For me, that would never work. It's like opening Pandora's box. I can't do it. I have to do all or nothing. Now I'm in control and I can plan it, but that's I, I pre-plan it. But if it's unplanned, I need to cut it out. So yeah. I think for most people, I think that works best. But if it works to cut it down, I think that's brilliant. Then mm-hmm. just do it and do whatever works for you. Um, have you heard of, I guess, the concept of abstainers versus moderators before? Yep. Yep, yep. Um, do you think that... I guess, applies to this situation? Is that why some people, um, what comes to mind is that whole, if it fits your macros group of people who say that as long as you're eating um, within your macros, it doesn't matter what foods you're eating. And yeah, they recommend like having a chocolate bar just here and there. But for someone like me, I can't just have a chocolate bar here and there. It starts to fuel it for me. So I think I'm definitely someone who... um, needs to abstain but do you think that's part of the reason why some um, people can do different approaches I guess yeah absolutely and the, again it's down to your preference if you if you are addicted to <laughs> now I haven't ever heard about anyone being addicted to eggs but if you could be addicted <laughs> to eggs and you would just keep eating eggs all the time even though you know it's super nutritious but you can't really stop then that yeah. would probably be a problem for you even though it's a healthy food. Um, it might not be a problem. And are you happy with doing that is my question. So I like being a bit flexible with that. I don't like, you know, putting, saying that this is the right way of doing it or not. But what I think for your peace of mind, anything that you feel addicted to is going to take up a lot of space in your mind. And you're just going to think about that all the time. And, for me, it's like, when am I going to go shop next time? What am I going to shop? What am I going to eat? When am I going to cook? When am I going to do this? And everything is just revolving around food. And when I've done that, what am I going to have for dessert? <laughs> and yeah. it takes up so much brain space. I don't have any energy left to do anything that I actually enjoy doing in life because it's so focused on food. So I think that is a, an unhealthy behavior, no matter what you're addicted to, that doesn't really allow for having a great life if you like if Mm -hmm. if you want to go that way (laughs) um so beyond I guess the pleasure that we get from eating sugar do you think there's any other purpose for it like is there any other reason we might want to eat it um for example like uh high intensity exercise I'm thinking of like cyclists how they have those gels of sugar in that situation do you think it's okay or yeah what are your thoughts on that Okay, so yes and no. So I think that no one should be consuming a lot of sugar ever. That's as a concept. And if you're an um, endurance elite athlete and you're going to compete, you might actually want to do it during competition. But I don't think health-wise is a good idea to do it when you're training. I think you should be training low on sugar and just get that whole system revved up so that you are really, really good at burning and converting fat into the sugar that you need and also the energy that you need when you're competing. In a competition, you obviously want to get the best out of both worlds. And I think that it might have a place there if it helps you. But just doing it like constantly when training for it because those guys are training hard and long and there's going to be a lot of sugar and I don't think that is good but um and I'm just speaking from a health perspective now yeah um otherwise type 1 diabetics maybe might need it if they have a hypo but okay. otherwise I can't really think about any other situation where I think that anyone should actually consume sugar seems a bit unnecessary actually (laughs) yeah yeah that's what I was thinking just wanted to hear your thoughts on that um so now I wanted to talk more about like artificial sweeteners or even natural sweeteners 
do they trigger that same response in our brains um, that real sugar does? Yes, I'm afraid so. Yep. Okay. So the problem with sweeteners, so first of all, most of them, especially the, the artificial ones, are that some of them are proven toxic to us. Some of them are not yet proven toxic, but they are man-made. We don't really know. And personally, I don't want to put things into my body. I don't know what it's doing. It's just, you know, taking a risk. And then in 10 years time, they might notice that, oh, people who are eating a lot of this sweetener are getting a lot more cancer than other people. I don't know yet. So it feels unnecessary to do it. I, I always say, like, if you're going to eat something sweet, why don't you just make it small and real sugar, actually? Having said that, I have been using a lot of stevia and erythritol myself up until not that long ago. I think those two, for me at least, are fairly safe. Uh, stevia is also an extract from a plant that should probably be the safest bet but some people are reacting to stevia so it's not necessarily a good thing for everyone but what I was doing by doing that is that I'm kind of feeding these uh, neural pathways in my brain so we always have when you're addicted to something you usually getting triggered by something whether that is a thought or if you get past something something will make you think about oh my god I need chocolate and then you will get the physical response, which for me is actually I start salivating, which is quite funny, like a dog, I'm drooling. <laughs> and then I will go and want that chocolate. So I will take action and go and get it so that I can eat it. So this is something that they are always triggered in, in, the, in the chain of events. And this chain of events will continue and if you're eating sweeteners, because you are just replacing sugar with sweetener and you're still going to have all these thoughts about food all the time you're never going to get rid of your cravings doing it this way so when i'm helping people quitting sugar i reprogram this response so you can have the thought or the trigger and you can start salivating but then we want to break the the, uh, the train of action there we don't want to go and get the chocolate some people like substituting it with something else, like doing push-ups or go uh, walk around the block. Or uh, one woman said that she took showers. And I thought, oh, my God, you must be clean because yeah. <laughs> we can have a lot of cravings. Yeah. Personally, what I find more, most useful is just practicing allowing the craving to be there and feel it as how does it actually feel in my body? And it's really unpleasant. But then when you kind of start looking at it, it's like it doesn't want to be looked at by me anyway. It kind of disappears and all of a sudden the craving is just gone. It might come back, but it's gone. And when I'm kind of resisting it and trying to push it away and trying to think about something else, it can be there for hours until I give in because it's driving me crazy. Yeah. So, so that's my preference. But if you want to replace it with something else that is healthy, go ahead. Okay. Um, so do you think this is why a lot of people... I guess, plateau on a keto diet. Maybe they're just replacing their old bad habits just with the new ones. And yeah, it's just, well, I guess I answered my own question. <laughs> yes. yes, but I actually forgot one thing. So yep. it's, it's good that you brought that up. So when you're on keto, you even if you are not actually eating sugar or, or a lot of carbohydrates, when you're having a sweetener, you might still trigger your insulin secretion and um, and release in your body because when you have sweet taste on your tongue, you will just your your body will anticipate real sugar, so it will respond as if there was real sugar coming, and then when there isn't any real sugar coming, it will have to store the glucose that you or the blood sugar that you already have in your blood, because. Normally, you would get an increase in it, but now it's storing it and you will get a decrease and you will start feeling very low and very irritable and very hungry. Um, it can actually lead to a lot of overeating. And uh, I mean, uh, I used to bake <laughs> lots of keto treats to have after dinner every day and they are very calorie dense. Let's just yeah. face it, that's what they are. So if I'm having like a really fatty, yummy dinner, that should be enough for me. But then I'm adding this on top. So even though we don't like talking about calories in, isn't actually calories out, at some point you're going to get too many calories for what you are actually using. So if you just keep eating and eating because you're hungry, 
it might be the sweetener that is triggering that hunger. So if you cut it out, your appetite might actually go down and you may be able to start losing weight again. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's everything I wanted to ask you today. Um, did you want to talk? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I said cool. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I know you have a free membership website. Did you want to tell us a little bit more about that and how people can join? Yeah, sure. So um, I have a free membership site. I call it Life Without Cravings because that's kind of what I do. I want people to be free of the, you know, the chatter in your brain. So you can find that on reinstallyourhealth.com and you can actually go to slash life without cravings and you'll find links to my youtube channel facebook page the free membership site all of that there if you want so that's a, a good way of getting in contact with me i have all sorts of things up there i actually have a free mini introduction course to quitting sugar where i'm teaching a few really good tips and tricks that you can use the techniques when you have cravings so that you can get over it. I'm talking more about what's actually happening in your brain so that people understand that it's nothing wrong with them. We're, we're not freaks, we're just normal people and we're actually really well adapted to survival and that's why we do react the way we're doing. And that can help sometimes. So I have lots of free stuff there. I'm doing free monthly Zoom calls where you can pop in and just ask questions if you have any questions about how to handle your cravings or problems with what you know getting rid of the sugar or whatever so you can just sign up there i can send you the link if you want to put it out yep i'll put it in the description box so everyone cool can yeah that's probably that easier out. yeah <laughs> and remember. right yeah are you doing a 30-day challenge right now and is this something that's reoccurring as well yes okay we are on i don't know when this is going to air but today when we're recording this we are on day 21 so it's probably it's going to be over before Christmas um I'm planning on running it again in mid late January probably so I before hopefully before you're airing this I can actually redo the web page where you can sign up and I can pre-sign up people for the January challenge if anyone wants to join I haven't done it yet though so <laughs> okay I'm just like when is it going to air <laughs> yeah um yeah we can talk about that after but yeah. perfect cool. all right well thank you so much okay. for coming on was there anything okay. else you want to add or no it's all good and um, thank you so much I love the work that you do I think that's really important and I think it's great that you are a little bit laid back and relaxed about the whole carny thing and you actually going outside the boundaries because we don't want to be like militant carnivores I don't think <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. And I will link everything um, to your YouTube, your Facebook, all okay. that in the description box down below. So if anyone wants to check that out, they can, yeah, find that thank there. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks, guys.